come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? (laughs) Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie review podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total galactic domination. That's right. We want to be the fastest growing podcast ever of all time. And to do that, we're going to need your help. So go on over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button. Give us a rating or a review. All that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you. We're a show where we talk about a movie that's chosen round robin each week by one of the Saturday night freak show, internet radio superstars. Allie, Michaela, John, and I'm Colin. (laughs) And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Colin. Uh, Colin, what did we watch tonight? What exploded into our faces? <laughs> what inv- what invaded the freak show tonight? <laughs> well, and tonight I, I had to make. Okay, so this is kind of a penance. Uh, you had to wrong. You had to write a wrong. Is what you had to do? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, because you did. I am yeah, also did. new to the cinema of Chuck Norris. Okay, <laughs> um, because uh like in the 80s when he was doing his thing at the peak of chuck norris powers i wasn't really like paying a whole lot of attention i mean because you had guys like uh stallone and schwarzenegger they were like the brand names and then below him you had the off-brand names which were like the uh you know well it seemed like it was seagal and uh van damme right and maybe norris was in there and then like charles bronson over in the corner and so I didn't really you watch a whole lot. Man of version of that, yeah. <laughs> so I watched, uh, I watched a bunch of uh, like his late in the '90s that I saw his stuff in the theater. And I was just like, I don't care about the Hitman, right? Or the Hero and the Terror or Hellbound. It just like didn't appeal to me at all. So I just kind of moved moved on. You know, you don't do it missing in action when you got the brand name, and that's Rambo. And so, right. um, but one of the ones that I saw, and this is uh, this is bringing you up to tonight, right? I saw a Chuck Norris movie called the Delta force and I'm like, well, this is actually like on its way to being like an actual movie. This is a pretty well-rounded experience. It's got drama. It's got heart. It's got action and adventure and terrorists and explosions. People and on planes. Yeah. And, uh, so I brought it to the freak show a few years ago and, uh, they hated it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So a universal panic is what it was. Yeah. I mean, but it's a, it's a pretty, you know, I think it's a, it's a much better well-rounded movie than tonight's thing. But tonight what we're going for is the absolute like main line, right? We're just going to pick that one exhilarating experience and fucking hit it over and over again with a hammer. And that is invasion USA. That's yes, right. inject it called, straight into my face. That's right. It's called entertainment, Colin. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> Why are you expecting a well-rounded, fully developed movie from canon? <laughs> well, the last one was the the Delta Force was a canon movie. That's what I'm saying. Why? But that's not their brand, though. Is what I'm saying. Like a, you said, that's a more well-developed, well-rounded movie. That's not what I want when I go see a canon movie. Oh, that's true. And it's and it's boring as shit. Yeah. <laughs> it is a more serious movie. That felt like a much longer movie. So well, well yeah, it was. It was like long. two hours plus because it was you know Jesus. this Israel- Israeli director trying to bring like a real life gravitas to a real life kidnapping situation, and uh, but with the added bonus of Chuck Norris. That's the Delta Force. With right? Roundhouse <laughs> kicks and throw punches. Yeah, yeah. This That's movie doesn't have that no, problem. This like, one doesn't have that problem because it's just trying to be like, I think this is the movie that all the Chuck Norris memes come from. I think so. I think it might be. Yeah. Uh, it would have to be. So we're it mainlining Chuck Norris. If tonight. you think about it, he doesn't have any like defining characteristics in this movie. Yeah. He can do everything. I think that <laughs> is, I think everything. that is the legend in which he is built on. Yeah. The, <laughs> like, like, that, he's, it is exemplified in, here. Yeah. <laughs> He's an amorphous blob that can do everything. So we're saying this movie is the ultimate Chuck Norris movie. Well, like, I haven't seen enough of them, right? But Yeah, uh, in my very uneducated <laughs> opinion, yes. Like, yeah. I'm not very well-versed. Well, right. I also think this it is maybe, like, his better. legacy movie, because you have, like, I mean, when you say the name Chuck Norris movies, 
I mean, now we think in TV, it's Walker, Texas Ranger. But I think in movies, I think you either think of Missing in Action or you think of uh, Invasion USA. Is there something else that yeah. comes to mind? Do like I it's like it, Holly. Sidekicks. <laughs> Sidekicks. <laughs> that was Holly trying to correct the wrong of bringing the wrong Chuck Norris movie to My, the Saturday I, Night Preacher. I, I, I regret nothing. I was surprised how long into viewing this it took you to bring up Sidekicks. I was, you know, I was really holding back. <laughs> well, this one comes at us from the year 1985, and it was directed it's a good year. by what's that? It's a good year. Apparently so. This was also, I think, the year that Missing in Action Two came out, because uh, <laughs> Missing in Action became like the, uh, the a big hit for Canon Films, right? So much so that actually there's a whole fucking story here, right? Because Chuck Norris. Well, okay, well, let's start with uh, Missing in Action because that was made by Joe Zito, who's also the director of this movie, right? Joe Zito, you horror fans may know he's the director of uh, The Prowler and Friday the 13th, the final chapter, right? And action Mm -hmm. fans will know him. He also did the uh, uh, Dolph Lundgren movie Red Scorpion after this. But so after Friday the 13th was a big hit. Canon goes, get that guy. We need to make a movie with that guy. He makes hit movies that come out number one. So they hire That's him. They always do. Right? They're like, he made a hit. Let's give him millions of dollars to make more hits for us. Yeah. Well, this is, I guess this is the thinking, right? It's always like the director makes the movie, uh, you know, if the movie's number one, it's because of the director, not because right. of who's in it or whatever. It's just, you know. So they hired him to do uh, a missing in action movie. They had actually gone to the Philippines or something. They were shooting one with Chuck Norris and they brought him down uh Joe Zito and he did the second one but apparently this is the way that I hear this so I don't know I can't really confirm this is anecdotal but it sounds like uh Canon liked Zito's version better than the original one right so they actually flipped the release dates they released the second one first in 1984 it became a huge hit and then they released the second one as missing an action to the beginning in 1985. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And by then, of course, Zito had moved on to his next movie with Chuck Norris, which was Invasion USA. Bravo. Did you know that Chuck Norris can strangle you with a cordless phone? Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's starting. Oh, oh I, I have I have retort, Colin. I came prepared. <laughs> Oh. Book of uh, Chuck Norris cannot be stopped in his hand. 400. 400. Look at the cover. Look, he's standing on a pile of Hitler, <laughs> Osama bin Laden, oh Batman's in there. He takes them all. I think the Grim. Wait, there's the Grim Reaper. He beat the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Did you get a book? Is that a book? You went and oh, bought the, the Predator. The Predator is there too. Is that the, like the book? What's it called? So many crossover opportunities. <laughs> But I like that he just I like that he defeated death. That brings up a really good point that Michaela made earlier that he could be a final destination crossover. Yeah. I'd watch the hell out Love of that. It. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you know that Bigfoot owns a grainy video of Chuck North? <laughs> that one okay, that's that that doesn't even make any sense. On so many levels. Chuck Norris doesn't lose weight, he discards it intentionally. Uh-huh. No. But, uh, did I you mean, know that Chuck Norris will do when they try to lose I weight? Like I, I was like, I feel like that's what everyone does when they successfully lose weight. Sean, Chuck Norris is a guy. I mean, I can believe it because he's a guy who makes onions cry. Mm. He's a guy who can kill two stones with one bird. <laughs> the dark <laughs> is afraid of Chuck Norris. You know, this whole thing that we're talking about right here, I had to actually go and look this up. So Chuck Norris obviously has become an Internet sensation a joke, right? Because of, uh, I think where it started was after sometime after Walker, Texas Ranger, right? Uh, Conan O'Brien got the rights to do it. Cause like, uh, NBC and universal merged and that gave Conan O'Brien the rights to a bunch of Walker, Texas Ranger clips. And so he had this bar, right. That he would just pull, on his show all the time and just show these random Walker, Texas Ranger clips out of context. And they were fantastically just goofy and the audiences loved them. It became a thing. Uh, that was like 2005, but in 2000, uh, what was it? 
2000, was it 2015? Something like that. Maybe it was older than that. It had to be. Uh, there was a guy, there was a guy started a website called Chuck Norris facts. And that actually started out as yeah. a Vin Diesel website where it was because of the pacifier movie. Uh, this guy had created this thing where you could basically just hit a button and it would give you these like mixed up, you know, uh, here's a noun pronoun, whatever Vin Diesel facts. And that kind of ran its course. And so he vote, he had a vote from among all the people who visited the site, like who should replace Vin Diesel and they said Chuck Norris, and boom, a legend was born. And it's been going yeah, ever it's since. for the better. Yeah. The Vin Diesel one doesn't sound nearly as charming. Mm-mm. No. I feel like Vin Diesel actually does believe those things about himself. <laughs> I agree. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you know that all of Chuck Norris's teeth are wisdom teeth? Did you know, Sean... If you spell Chuck Norris yes, in Colin. Scrabble, you win forever. <laughs> should we Chuck just Norris stop Mount Everest I was like, by should, accident? Can I leave? Is this should, what you guys do? Okay. Yeah, I got a whole go. book here. Okay. I'm gonna put the book down. All right, we got to We got to You got to. You got to sneak them in though. <laughs> so that's. Uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, after the podcast credits have rolled, there will be an extra twenty minutes of just me and Colin saying these jokes. Back Chuck and Norris jokes. <laughs> okay. Here's my that's question it. about Chuck Norris, though, like. Why post 9-11, like, you bring up the fact that Osama's on the cover of that book. Why post 9-11 has he not, like, kind of had, like, a resurgence? If there was ever a time for him to, like, come back, wouldn't that have been it? As in, like, a movie and a movie star and all that? Yeah, or, like, yeah. even if it's ironically, you know? I think Steven Seagal stole all that thunder. Have you ever seen all the DirecTV Steven Seagal movies? No, because no one has seen them. Oh, my them. God. He's, he does <laughs> tons, and they're all uh, very... Um, nationalistic very uh bad yeah i guess my thing is the like the the like meme nature of chuck norris combined with like our post 9-11 crave to like uh stamp out foreign threats <laughs> would seem like the like, perfect mixture to like launch him back into the mainstream well i think his problem see, was I unlike uh see i mean that's why obviously i think we got rambo came back but he, chuck norris really didn't the, his problem, I think, was that he really didn't have a, char- a character until Walker, right? Like, yeah, there isn't, right. like, a character yeah. that you identify with Chuck Norris. He never had that. He's kind of like Jason Statham in that way. It's like Statham isn't regarded as, like, one of the great action heroes because he never had that character that stuck. You know, the closest he's got is, like, what, the mechanic? Or not the mechanic, the, the transporter, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think that it's it's a that's why it takes a certain combination of like this actor uh, and a character to actually kind of make it happen. And Matt Hunter, the character from Invasion USA, is sadly not. You could be that. completely making that up because I was just going to ask what his character's name was because everyone just calls him Cowboy. <laughs> it is. It's Matt Hunter. I mean, I was curious if he that? actually had a name. What else would you yeah. call? <laughs> Matt Hunter. No it's got to be Hunter or something like that. I have no way of refuting that, Colin, because never heard it in the movie. Oh, well, they the say o- it over and over only, again. The only thing I remember was when they show up at his shack and the the fan his fan boat friend is like Matt to like get his attention. That's the only thing I remember. Yeah, so and, and the cowboy. bad guy, the bad guy yeah. Rostov, is like, we have to kill Hunter. It's actually a bad name for Chuck Norris because he does, we know that he doesn't go hunting because the word hunting just kind of implies the possibility of failure. Chuck Norris goes killing. That one just landed with a thud. It was my yeah, delivery? That, okay. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction <laughs> unless they're really worth it. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the movie, he plays Matt Hunt. Matt Hunter is a retired uh, CIA He's agent. He's always retired. He doesn't do that anymore, Colin. He's extensively he always retired has to be just back all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, he thought he was out. They murder his friend. <laughs> somebody like murdered friend. Uh, You're right. This I movie does like, the armadillo. This plays right by like all of the um it's like I mean they were cliches in the nineteen eighties when this movie came out. Right? I mean it's like right down the line. They kill his friend, he's like now it's this time it's personal, right? And he's got to go after the guy. He's after a guy named, uh, well, I mean, I think for the first time, this is why, you know, like the, when we first meet Matt Hunter, um, he's out 
in the Florida Everglades, tooling around on his wind boat, propeller boat, whatever that thing is, what a hovercraft. Fan boat. Thank fan you. Boat. And the second time we see him, what's he doing? Wrestling, Wrestling in a gator. gator. <laughs> Wrestling. That's right. Wrestling a gator. Wrestling an alligator, ladies and gentlemen. I assume that's just everyday life in Florida. Yeah. Right? So doesn't everyone do that in Florida? Oh, do they? See, I was hoping this was a Matt Hunter kind of thing. Then only Matt Hunter goes out and just wrestles gators like that's what he does in his and uses chainsaws to cut down tree limbs or whatever he's doing in his shack. I feel like I feel like when you're living among like basically dinosaurs like that, you have to be prepared for that at least. Yes. Right. Everyone's got a minor degree in alligator wrestling at some point if you go through college in Florida. They all keep duct tape on them just in case they need to tape up their mouths, you know. Right. <laughs> well, I'm surprised it, he wasn't chopping up that wood with just his hand. <laughs> I kind of was too, really. He has a pet armadillo, did we say? Oh my god. So cute. Never, never did I know I wanted this until it happened. You know, now you want an armadillo for a pet? Uh, <laughs> I just want to watch it more it on TV. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. When it flipped over his little milk bowl. <laughs> I liked when it was hungry. nestling in the, when it was like burrowing in the blanket to get comfortable like a cat. I was like, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, that's so fun cute. Spot. I didn't know they, they like did things like that, you know? Yeah. Well, usually you don't see them outside of like, uh, what? well, I suppose it is the South, but like I was associated so, like, with the armadillo with like of Texas. Outside the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> on the side of a road in yeah. Usually how I yeah. see them. Yeah. It's usually a bad omen at the beginning of a movie when someone's driving down a highway. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Pretty sure that happens in Breakdown. Well, it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Doesn't start yep. with a uh, arm bill. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I mean, so just, you know, I mean, it is actually, we are looking at Chuck Norris wrestling an alligator. Like, it isn't a stunt guy wrestling an alligator. I just want to impress this upon the listener. It's actually a couple of actors down there wrestling an alligator, right? This is yeah. because this is why I love the eighties and their total disregard for like safety concerns <laughs> of actors. Like nobody would do this now. A lot <laughs> just of just get in there and get it. It would never happen now. Yeah. There's a stunt scene later on where Chuck Norris is hanging on to the side of a um a pickup truck racing through a mall and it's Chuck Norris. On the, the yeah. side of, yeah, but we'll get to that. I just want to give you a teaser of what's ahead in this amazing movie called Invasion USA. So, Matt Hunter, basically, he's forsaken the life, right, of a clandestine secret agent or whatever, soldier. And he's like, I'm just going to go hang out here in the Florida Everglades, right? And um, simultaneously with this, there is a Russian bad guy named Rostov who is plotting the invasion USA, right? Yes. Yes. The titular. Yeah. We know he's a bad guy because he just looks sinister. Yeah, what he's... happened to Richard Lynch? Well, you want me to tell you? I'll tell you. Yeah, uh, please. I figured you had this in the, you know, in the chamber. In so. your back Give pocket, yeah. Next to the jokes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did you know that Chuck Norris can drown a fish? No. Grab the wrong pocket, I see. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, Richard Lynch, I guess before he was an actor, so this comes from sometime in the uh, 60s, I believe. So, I think he was like in his 20s at the time in Central Park, right? Uh, he was under the influence of, it just said under the influence of drugs, and he lit himself on fire, and he burned 70% of his body. And so that kind of right. gives him this distinct, I mean, he's got Freddy Krueger skin, basically, right? I was going to say it looked, he looked severely burned, but I didn't know if that was like uh, a choice for this movie, like a makeup for this movie, or if that's what he actually looked like. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, because I was like, if those are prosthetics, they're fantastic. Is that what <laughs> yeah. he uh, uh, That's what he looks like. Yeah, that's yeah, his that's actual skin. The other place I saw him was, uh, what, Rob Zombie's Halloween, where he shows up as the... He's the principal? Principal oh, in the bathroom right. and everything, which scared the shit out of me, because I'm like, wow, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah, because usually he plays bad guys. Well, he was actually, he was in, um, he was supposed to be in Lords of Salem, and they shot his part. He was actually supposed to be, um, not jo uh, John Hawthorne, but the judge, 
and they had to uh, he didn't never finished his part because of his health or whatever he died uh, i think either during the making of it or shortly thereafter and so mm-hmm. they had to recut the movie to give another character his part you know or another actor his part and all this stuff wasn't but, his, weren't his scenes also like allegedly the same ones that Sid Haig were, was into? Yeah. So that's how his role got cut as yep. well. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that is that's it. Uh, yeah, because that movie was made very cheap, and they were like, "We just have to keep going. We got to keep going. Mm-hmm. We can't, you know." Um, but I mean, Richard Lynch, he'd been around for a while. He uh, after the '60s, I think um, he was encouraged to get into the actor studio and become an actor. This is after he recovered and swore off drugs, you know. Uh, <laughs> For a you know, good reason. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one way to go. And he was in, um, I actually just saw him in William Peter Blatty's. I watched the ninth configuration the other night and he was in that, but he's probably known to uh, sci fi uh, fantasy people as he was um, the bad guy in a movie called The Sword and the Sorcerer back in the 80s. Uh, he was also uh, the bad guy in a movie called Bad Dreams, which starred the punk rock girl from Nightmare on Elm Street 3. She was in it. She was like he was a cult leader that had died in a fire and kept coming back to her as a spirit. And now knowing that that's what happened to him, I was like, "Wow, yeah. okay, you actually, you know, <laughs> we're going to be this uh, burned, uh, you know, character from the past or whatever." It was like a nightmare. Yeah, I hope he was okay with being cast as a bad guy for the rest of his life. Well, the other guy who's in this movie too, like early on, did you recognize Billy Drago? He's the guy that uh, they go to buy the arms from uh, because Richard Lynch, he's, you know, he's got a. He, oh, yeah, him. Yeah. And you're like, that guy, like that guy's never going to have a romantic lead in his life. Right. He's never going <laughs> to no. be an action hero. Right. Billy Drago is always going to be a bad guy. And you got Richard Lynch and Billy Drago like doing this stare down contest. Right. An ugly face off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a hard scene to watch. How come? Because their faces. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Holly was having a real problem. They're very sinister looking guys. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. You get typecast. Billy Drago was in uh he was Elliot Ness in uh, the Untouchables. That was probably his biggest role. Um Yeah. But he was also the uh, in the remake of The Hills Have Eyes. He was Papa Jupiter in the remake of The Hills Has Eyes. He was on like Charmed if you're a fan of Charmed. He was on like 5 seasons, I think 6 episodes or something on the show Charmed. And Sean, demon. looking at you. Yeah, that's me. That's why. So you recognize him? He was a demon. The demon's name was. Uh, I don't even know. Oh, come on, Barbus. Uh, Barbus the demon. Ah, that sounds familiar. There you go. I don't know what he looks like. He was also in Michael Jackson's "You Rock My World" video. Anyone? Anyone? I mean, who was? Okay. Um, but that's an interesting scene because as Holly says, two guys that are very intense, slimy looking fellas and they're staring each other down. Uh, Richard Lynch has stolen a bunch of, um, cocaine from Cuban immigrants with they pretend to be like the American, um, Navy or uh, coast guard, mow them all down in the hor- horrifying opening sequence. And then they're going to buy arms from Billy Drago so they give him the cocaine in exchange for the arms. And this is the first scene that kind of establishes, to me, I mean, aside from, you know, Chuck Norris's uh, mullet flapping in the wind and, and wrestling alligators. But this uh, is kind of like the tone of the movie here. Yes. Right. What would you think of this scene? Shocking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, needed. I'm glad it set the pace this early in the movie. Like, I needed that. Just so I didn't have to figure, like, guess where this was going. Like, oh, okay, this is what this movie's going to be. Thank you. Yeah, you didn't want another Delta Force. I get you. I get you. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Delta Force was the slow I'm build. To say the- it suddenly, the action uh, was right off the bat, which is very yeah. much appreciated. And it's, it's like, violent. Like, sh- the woman gets her face smashed into the, into the cocaine, gets the straw yeah. for nose. He gets shot in the balls and thrown out a window. Like, goddamn. <laughs> Our first de- defenestration. It was fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, it's very brutal. That was the scene that I remember, like, the kids in, in school had seen that. And they're like, it's just, he, like, slams her head down. On, it's the, the scene from The Dark Knight with the pencil, only with That's the cocaine was, straw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Richard Lynch slams better. her head down. And then blows Billy Drago's balls off. Ouch. 
out the window. Yeah. So this guy, Rostov, is a bad guy. But it turns out that Rostov has a prior experience with Matt Hunter, right? They have a past. Mm -hmm. What's that? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, so the, the scene the scene right where he's like because when the cia guy comes to matt hunter to offer him the job rostov's in the country not my problem anymore is your problem you should have let me kill him when he ha- when i had the chance right that's all these guys say right but uh uh it turns out that matt hunter could have killed rostov at some kind of uh, foreign embassy like assassination thing and right before he did uh, apparently he was prevented we don't see this but it's a flashback points the gun at Rostov's head, and he says, it's time to die. Which becomes a key phrase in the movie, which is repeated over and over again throughout the film. Uh, Rostov actually wakes up from this. It's a nightmare that the, the bad guy is having nightmares about Chuck Norris in this movie. Love it. I have a theory. Love it. Uh-oh. I got Uh-oh. a theory about this. Okay. Let's hear it. <laughs> so... Well, I got this thought in my head because I'm watching the first, the last time I was watching it, it came out on Blu-ray or whatever. And I'm checking it out. It's made by the guy who made Friday the 13th, right? There's a scene on a beach where like these teenagers get killed by the terrorists right before the landing of the boats and whatever show up. And I'm like, wow, this is like a Friday the 13th scene. And then I was like, you got, you know, your bad guys waking up all the time going like, uh, Hunter, they have to kill him. And you're like, why would you derail your entire invasion operation to kill this one man? Of course, it's, you know, it's a rational idea because the guy's Chuck Norris. But I got the idea that, like, Chuck Norris is kind of like the Jason of this movie. Because he pops out of nowhere, he kills a bunch of uh, of terrorists, right? The bad guys. Pops up, kills them, always staring at them. He never blinks. He just stares, right? He's their worst nightmare, and he's always hunting the one who got away. Rostov. It's like instead of kids going into his woods, the terrorists come into his his territory, his country, right? And like a mythical being, that's right, I came up with this all on my, on my own. Like a mythical being, he arises from the Florida Everglades like kind of a um, he's like he's like Uncle, he's like the more militant monk, Uncle Sam, right? Like he doesn't exist yes. until we need him. And then he's, because he's just out there wrestling alligators and stuff. But when we need him, he arises from the muck of the Everglades and he comes to, and he just seems to know where all the bad guys are and just shows up and fucking drop grenades on him or, you know, roundhouse kicks him in the face or, you know, stabs hands to tables and he's killing them with their, with his pickup truck and all this other stuff. Then at the end, he retreats back to the he Everglades. Does. And he, he does have that transport ability as well. He mm-hmm. just arrives yeah. at the areas he needs to be in. And he's got Chuck Norris sense. Right? I mean, am I wrong here? There's a scene Does toward the end. Does his mullet stand up on end? Is that, what, <laughs> is that how he identifies what's going on? No, the buttons <laughs> pop open on his denim shirt. <laughs> yeah. Every time he's <laughs> somewhere, there's trouble. Shirts don't like Chuck Norris. They just, like, jump off of his, uh, off of his chest, apparently. Depending on how much danger, like, that's the number of buttons that go up. If it's one button, it's just, like, mild danger. Oh, yeah, we're like on DEF four. CON 4, four buttons yeah. fly off. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So when he's being arrested, and he's like, oh, shit. It was about to go down. It was buttons then. You're full on threat level midnight at that yeah. point. I think because when he got arrested, his shirt was like fully open, right? It had only yeah. been like halfway buttoned up until then, but it was, yeah. I bet yeah, I Chuck could go Norris back is to naked. Sleep. We're all going to die. <laughs> well, the. Do you uh, have a Chuck Norris scale of like, can we use that as the national emergency chart? <laughs> <laughs> I think like, it could based on this poster out- alone. He starts out in full denim, and he'll lose his, like, sleeves first. Sleeves always go first. <laughs> and then slowly button. That actually explains a lot about the poster of this movie. I think so. Which may oh, be think- one of the most awesome, macho fucking movie posters ever made. <laughs> it's just Chuck Norris standing Murder with... Murder Hornets put us at four buttons. <laughs> Murder Hornets? I think so. Yeah, Murder Hornets put us at four buttons, right? We were probably at three before that. Now we're at four. Yeah, they better watch out. Yeah, that shirt's almost unbuttoned. 
<laughs> some roundhouse kicks coming their way. <laughs> he didn't do Invasion a whole lot of USA Part Two. He didn't do a whole lot of roundhouse kicking in this movie. I was kind of disappointed. There's at least one good kick to the face. Uh, There's a few good like, kicks. Yeah, in the end, he like kicked that one guy in the face, but he never hit, did like the actual roundhouse. Whoops. No, there was no roundhouse. I was kind of hoping for that. He's got guns. He doesn't need to do that. In this movie. He didn't actually. Acc- he didn't want to accidentally kill someone. Colin, Jesus. <laughs> Not it's like the makers of this movie. Throwing roundhouse kicks out there like nothing. Yeah. I know um, the uh, Tom Savini was the makeup effects guy in this movie. Because obviously, like, the director of photography came over from uh, Friday the 13th, part four. Uh, Tom Savini had worked on The Prowler with Joe Zito and Friday the 13th, part four. And so he was working on this. And in an interview, he was talking about, like, I mean, because basically, you know, this was like one of the bigger gigs that Tom Savini had worked on. I think actually Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger were also there. And they just said, they, you know, they brought the, uh, the effects guys down to a hotel and they weren't needed as much as they were on, like, those lower budget horror movies where there's, you know, a lot of practical effects. This was, I mean, there was explosions going off and, you know, that kind of stuff. These guys were only dealing with the mangled bodies and stuff like gunshot hits and stuff like that. So they had a lot so, of time to like screw off and, and do a bunch of stuff. But he said he met. What's that? Well, I was going to say, so is he responsible for the pile of men in their underwear dead on the boat? That was hilarious. <laughs> is that they're doing? Well, I think he did the, you noticed when the, when the, they trampled the bodies of the teenagers on the beach and like broke their, yeah, I think that's the Tom Savini gag, but there's nothing that, stands out and calls himself but he said that you know he met t- uh, chuck norris and he's like chuck norris is the n- nicest guy but i got the impression that like that guy was just like coiled like ready to strike like at all times he's like if something happened i'd be like what the but chuck norris would be able to handle it he's like that's just who chuck is chuck is that guy <laughs> like, wow it's amazing yeah i would love to meet I'd love to just stand next to Chuck Norris for like a minute. Just, I just want to see what feeling he gives off. I'm kind of surprised he doesn't do conventions, honestly. Oh, he, I'm pretty sure he does NRA conventions. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> NRA and whatever Bowflex or whatever uh, machine. Was it the Tybo? Machine he did. Was it Tybo? Tybo or something no, like that? No, what did he, do? he did. No, he did it was his own Tybo. exercise machine. I forgot what it was called. I'm going to look it up. Well, he had those jeans, too. What were the jeans called that he had that had, like, extra flexibility in them? He had Chuck Norris jeans? Yeah, he, there's, like, in the 80s, they were, like, he, like, the advertisement was, like, you can roundhouse kick in these pants, was, like, how they sold it. <laughs> so, he, like, so he, was, he was the, he was the originator of the stretchy jeans? Yeah, like, let me see if I can pull God, up the I love stretchy jeans. I'm gonna add this to Nordic the track. Chuck Norris fact. Nordic track, that was it. Big Nordic track. Nordic track. Was that him and Christy yeah. Brinkley? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay, was that Nordic track? All right. Oh, and the Wait, total they were called jeans. Action Jeans. Action Jeans? You guys see that? Action Jeans. All right, I'm looking <laughs> on Amazon right fantastic. now for some Action Jeans. <laughs> yeah, Google. It. I'm pretty Won't sure find I have a pair. Like... I'm hoping that they still make them. Well, this guy, I mean, he did a whole bunch of stuff. Chuck Norris, I mean, he was a um, he was a martial artist, you know, obviously before he was an actor, because uh, he was in the uh, U.S. Air Force. And while he was on an Air Force base um, overseas, he actually um, started his own martial arts discipline, and it was called Chun Kuk Do. That's right. Bam. Chuck Norris invented his own martial arts discipline. Moved to Hollywood, he was going to be a police officer, and while he was applying, he opened a martial arts studio, and that's when like these Hollywood people would come in, and uh, I think it was Steve McQueen said that he should become, or try acting, and through that, he ended up meeting Bruce Lee, he was in Bruce Lee's Return of the Dragon, then he came back here, and then he did all the Chuck Norris movies that I haven't seen, which is like Breaker Breaker and Lone Wolf McQuaid and Force of One and, you know, Good Guys Wear Black and all that stuff. I did see Silent Rage, where he basically takes on Michael <laughs> Myers, which is uh, probably another Saturday Night Freak Show movie at some point down the road. But yeah, I mean, he's like uh, all around. I mean, he's done a lot because I think Chuck Norris is 80 years old this year. I think I just saw like he had his birthday. Wow. Yeah. 
So that's probably also why he's not like hasn't had like a big resurgence. He's got like at least you know, it feels like twenty years on Stallone. I think maybe the last time we saw him in a movie oh, was uh, Expendables. Yeah, Stallone's in the seventies. Okay, Stallone's so, in his seventies and he's still working. Yeah, well, uh, ex- was it Expendables two? Chuck Norris was in briefly for a Chuck Norris joke. Yeah, I think mean, he walked probably, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's also written some books. That's right. Oh, great. You can only imagine. Uh, Black Belt Patriotism, How to Reawa- Reawaken America. What? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no. 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 I've heard no. Enough. No. <laughs> the no. Secret no. of My Inner Strength, or I, Secret of Inner Strength, My Story. That's another one, apparently, bestseller. I, oh, no, Chuck. I want to know as little about this as possible so I can <laughs> still enjoy a Chuck Norris movie. <clears throat> Should I happen to watch another one? Well, anytime I, anytime I see anything online about his conservatism, I'm like, I just don't want to know. I don't want to know. Well, I mean, the guy's always been like a, a patriot, I suppose. And that's why he's always kind of been drawn to these type of, of stories. In fact, he came up with the idea for this one uh, because he read an article in Reader's Digest, which said something about the idea that there were terrorist se- sleeper cells, you know, all throughout America. And he's like, man, that's a really like scary idea. We should make a movie about that. That movie is Invasion USA. I don't like, think that idea comes across very well in this movie. <laughs> Thank you, Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk about some of the exciting set pieces in Invasion USA, because basically the movie is going to try and um, it's the terrorists, their whole plan, because there's not like a whole lot of them, and apparently they're a multinational uh, like band of mercenaries. They're not like a national organization, right? It's not state sponsored. Rostov is the head and he's got an Italian guy named Nico as his second in command. That's basically all we know of the command structure. After that, it's like, I mean, there are guys speaking Chinese. There's guys speaking Arabic. There's guys speaking Russian. Uh, everybody is in this mix, right? And yeah. they basically oh, land yeah. on a beachhead and then disperse throughout the United States with an effort, uh, with a plan to cause mayhem, blow up as much shit as you can, but get the people to turn against each other and get them to, you know, turn against authority. They pretend to be National Guard. They pretend to be police, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, they're trying to cause anarchy. Um, so a lot of these scenes then are kind of, um, they're like, they're they're zeroing in on specific American events, right? Shopping at the mall, uh, having a barbecue, um, Christmas, yeah, on anywhere street America or whatever, right? Mm. Although this scene yeah. is fucking great because it's night, Christmas, Florida, on <laughs> any town USA street, and I got to tell you, my street is not as active as this one in this movie. This is so goddamn active for like the middle of the night or well, I guess it was probably like seven o'clock at night, but like in the middle of winter during Christmas, it was just random. It was really weird. It wasn't like, it wasn't like summer and kids are outside playing. It was like a Tuesday in In Florida. It's nice out all the time. So yeah, true. They don't go down like we do during the winter. No, and I'm just concerned about the uh, the couple making out surrounded by six teenagers um, playing football. Oh, you don't that do was that weird. Wrong? No, I, I I don't really think I do. Although you know, maybe in my younger days, I'm not as desperate now. So, <laughs> well, it's like a, it's like a rock went rock or a Norman Rockwell tableau of America: teenagers <laughs> yeah. making out in a car, kids playing uh, basketball in the street, right? And kids decorating the Christmas tree in the yard or whatever. Yeah. All of this we get to see. And then the evil terrorists show up. And with a rocket launcher, Rostov, like, blows up, uh, like, several houses. Houses! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. An un- yeah. An unlimited, never-ending supplied rocket launcher. Right? <laughs> he got the cheat code. Uh, yeah. We were trying to figure out, like, is this, uh, like, how many rockets can you put in a rocket launcher? I think you only get one shot. I think you get one. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. But not Rostov. Sure. He can just multi-fire that fucking thing. It's that's awesome. how evil that gun is. Yeah. I, see, I like where your head's at. Because that's where we're... <laughs> that's the level of play. That's where you gotta be. <laughs> for this movie. Yes. Yeah. It's an evil gun. 
Well, it turns out they were able to do that, I guess, because that whole neighborhood was going to be demolished. It was part of their, the airport nearby was going to build like a, an extension. So they were going to demolish the whole neighborhood. So the production was able to buy those houses for seven grand a piece. Blow them nice. Up. Nice. Wow. Seven grand cool. in 1980s money. Um, so they blow all that shit up. They then attack a barbecue out in front of, I think it was like a Cuban restaurant or something there in Miami. Uh, pretending to be cops, this turns the, uh, the the party goers against the police. Um, we see Chuck Norris driving through like a neighborhood, and everybody's like yelling at him and jumping on his car. I was trying to figure out like, was that because yeah, what did he do? Well, that's why I was like, was that because it was a bad neighborhood, or because of all the seeds of discord that had been sown throughout the United States that that was just people reacting to that? I didn't get the discord part at this point. It just seemed like they, I didn't know. I'm like, is he in a cop car? What's going on? Yeah, I would argue. Yeah. Expl- I would argue neither explanation makes any sense because, right. like, we don't know enough about Chuck Norris in this movie to know why they would hate him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the the movie is a little murky, and it's one of those movies where the scope of the movie is bigger than what they could show. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. This is supposed to show discord throughout the entire United States. But we just so get instead, kind of they just scenes. have a news broadcaster say it. Yeah. yeah, late in the movie, too. It seemed like it was when we were getting, like, you know, shots of, uh, what was it, uh, side of the highway on fire and all this other stuff. Stuff that the movie couldn't actually afford to shoot itself, even though this was, like, a big-budget movie for canon. I think it was, like, a $12 million movie or something at the time, which was, like, double the highest uh, budget Norris had ever worked with. I mean, they do, in the end of this movie, bring in helicopters and tanks rolling through the streets you know yeah i mean there's like i was f- really shocked by that honestly yeah yeah the end of the the end of this movie is impressive i, I was the- surprised canon was able to pull it off yeah yeah i mean it's something i mean it's kind of uh you know a little mini war that they have there and this i guess was atlanta mm-hmm. oh funny story about that you know that scene where that helicopter was like dropping the leaflets all over yeah, uh, downtown Atlanta, and they say basically like you know martial law or something like that. You know you're you're, you're under uh, attack. The helicopters yeah. were supposed to drop blank red leaflets, and you'd see the close up of the real one right on the street. They'd swap it out, but the prop department apparently dropped the real one. So the people Uh-oh. of Atlanta actually thought there was an invasion going on. And they said that there oh was some God. like couple oh, that they no. found. You know, like a week later, had been hanging out in their basement waiting for the all clear. Yeah, um, I'm telling you, it was a different time I back in the eighties. You got away. You got right? away with a lot. <laughs> they should have just sent Chuck Norris door to door and be like, "It's okay, I've got it handled." That's right. <laughs> because Chuck Norris knows that the quickest way to a man's heart is with his fist. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that Chuck Norris once... Oh, yeah, he's putting forth <laughs> just sigh at you. <laughs> Chuck Norris doesn't shower, Holly. He just takes blood baths. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, well, tell me about some of these action scenes. What were your favorites? What was the things that stood out about... Uh, about the, the car chase is good, The which starts out like... <laughs> first of all, it starts out at the mall. Uh, the terrorists are going to drop a bomb at the mall. And then uh, that goes a little haywire. <laughs> um, the terrorist with the glasses, who never speaks, I'm pretty sure he's lost his tongue, um, drops a Christmas package, and uh, there's a very like, incessant like good Samaritan. Given, I like that you've given this random character a backstory, Sean. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's the most interesting. He's like the one nerdy white guy in the group right. who, who's like, that guy's fucking dangerous. Cause he's the one nerdy white guy hanging out with this group. And he hasn't said a word. Yeah. That guy's a psycho. He's Guaranteed. like, cause he's Russian or something. And the accent will give him away or so. He doesn't know the language or something. No, he doesn't speak I'm reading too to much. Into the, yeah. But he drops off the package. There's a very insistent, good Samaritan who really wants to give his package back to the dude. <laughs> sir, sir, <laughs> Sir. I'm sorry, would you would you chase someone down to try to give them their bag back? It was halfway through the mall he was chasing him. He it was literally stopped. running. Yeah. Not in a post-9-11 world. Fuck no. No. I mean, you see dead. something, you say something, but that's it. And there is, like, armed, there are armed guards in this mall, too, as we find out when the little uh, brat of a kid is, you know, whatever, tormenting the police guy. But, yeah. Fuck that kid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Fuck him. 
Yeah. Throwing, throwing gum at shit. I, fuck, fucking kids. A little, a little bastard. His bastard. attitude about it is what really sucked. Yeah. But that's okay. the scene where Chuck Norris, like, uh, just drives his pickup truck through the uh, the glass door of the mall, right? Because, like... God forbid there's people standing right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but don't worry, he's not going to hit him, Sean. He's not going to hit him. He's, he's Chuck not. Norris. It's Chuck Norris, he knows. Yeah, he knows. How did he know where they were? He can just feel it. He, he can just sense it, it. Yeah. I'm telling you, he is a supernatural being conjured up. I'm telling you, he's Uncle Chuck out to defend us. Conjured up by the patriotism of Americans, he just comes to be. He's like Captain Planet. I, think I was going to say, is he, is he Captain America? <laughs> yes, Basically. he is. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine him in a Captain America uniform with just the mullet hanging out in the back? And the beard? I oh my god. Already exists on the internet somewhere, I guarantee. Uh, but, 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 but the outfit has buttons and they're all unbuttoned. <laughs> <laughs> right, all unbuttoned, and he just murders people. Maybe that's the whole thing. He just he flexes, and the shirt like Hulk like just. But we never see that happen. It's just assumed. I mean, the right? buttons are scared see, of Chuck. Norris. This is why. This I think this is why Chuck Norris, the legend of Chuck Norris, and why he's never like <laughs> steered into this stuff because we're doing all that work for him. He doesn't need to like actually do this stuff. It's all up here in us. That's why he just remains a stone cold. He lives. So you're saying. So you're saying he lives in all of us? I think so. <laughs> I think it's a little part of us that is, uh, Chuck Norris is in us all, Holly. I believe so. <laughs> Whenever we wear denim, he Chuck is the embodiment. So, so Chuck Norris is the embodiment of the American spirit, is what I you're saying? So. I think so. He, he. Yes. All right. I, I think, think he, he believes I think he that. This is bald eagles, is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. I was wondering if you guys were going to get on board with this movie, but clearly you have. <laughs> so oh, there it oh. is. Colin, I told you as soon as we saw him on the on the fan boat with his mullet flapping in the wind, I was sold on this movie. <laughs> that was yeah, glorious. That's a goddamn American right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's at, uh, that, at that moment. At that moment, I was like, "Oh, please don't let me down. I have so much <laughs> hope for this movie right now." <laughs> and he. And he, he throttled that boat and he said, I won't. I won't let you down, Holly. I will live <laughs> up to your to expectation. Me. He it's all to me through Prime. Yes. <laughs> I loved how much fan boat action there was in this movie. Yes. I love yes. that, like, that uh, fan boat drifting he was doing when he came out of the weeds that one time. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And all the bad guys uh, are also on fan boats yeah. when they blow up his and fucking they, like, house. they choreographed their movements together, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all this stuff is pretty good. That was like some that was like some GI Joe shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that chase scene that you're talking about that starts in the mall that goes the entire way yeah. through the mall with Chuck Norris hanging on the door eventually ends up in the parking lot with a woman hanging on the bad guy's door and Chuck Norris and the reporter girl have to like try and get her off and rescue her as they're driving down the street at like full speed. And then there's like grenades tossing the thing and then the thing explodes and you're just like, this is, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and then go, it's caught off for like 10 minutes, big action scene in the middle of the movie. That's wonderful. Was that the best one? Oh, the school bus is my favorite. What happens school there? School bus, fun. The school bus is great. Chuck Norris's commentary on the school bus one is the best. <laughs> what are you talking about? Where he's just like, uh, what do you say? I think you dropped this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, but this is another case of uh, Chuck sense, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. Because like, how did he know there was a bomb? So the bad guys go and they have one of those sticky bombs, right? They stick it on a school bus because I mean, what is more American well, back than a up bus a through bit. a school or a Why bus through a kid? school bus exist and where is it going? <laughs> because in a national emergency, you put your children on a bus and just send them off. Oh, like, just a bunch just of random kids that we have no context for. No. <laughs> and no. they're all singing well, in unison. Yeah. They're just giving you the icon- iconography of, like, kids on a school bus in danger. That's all they want to get out of this. Because there's nothing yeah. more American than kids on a school bus. My theory uh, of Chuck's sense is I'm pretty sure he's able to control bald eagles to do his scouting for him. Oh, he can warg into him? <laughs> I think so. Like like he's got like a Fran in Game of Thrones? He's, he's got a sense. Into <laughs> yeah, they are on his side. Um, yeah. And I think that's why they're endangered, actually. They keep, you know, he, he uses them up, I have a feeling. <laughs> so every time he uses a bald eagle, it dies? I, <laughs> just drop I, it out I of think the sky? so. 
Well, this is I why mean, they stop making Chuck Norris movies. They're like, Chuck, we have to protect the population. We can't let you do this anymore. Quarantine this is madness theory. is really settling in for you, isn't it, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a little deep into Chuck Norris conspiracy <laughs> theories, huh? No, it's, I don't. I don't think legend. he's far off though, because I mean, a dinosaur once looked at Chuck Norris the wrong way, and look what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, Stone Cold Silence is the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, he he exhibits this. Okay, so not only does he know that there is a terrorist threat here, but the bad guys stick the uh, the sticky grenade on the bus. He retrieves it right because he's Chuck Norris. As the thing counts down from two hundred, not two minutes, from two hundred <laughs> on the timer, and then he uh, drives up. Okay, but this is where Chuck sense comes in because somehow he is able to intuit out of all the traffic up ahead of him, which car is the terrorist car so he can affix the uh, bomb to the terrorist car. And he doesn't even like break up just some threat. random old couple. Yeah. He doesn't hit the wrong, right, doesn't mean, wrong people. He hits the, the terrorist. He doesn't break a sweat, yet he's sweating this entire movie, which I love. He's sitting he in bed watching so UFO unfair. movies and he's sweating. <laughs> yeah, he gets a great idea. The way you actually stop Rostov is that uh, he sur- Well, he, he gets himself captured by the police. The police have the kind of the... They have... Because I think in the movie you have to have this scene where the police basically say, like, basically you're a vigilante. No one is above the law, right? Because in reality, this behavior would not be tolerable, right? In a movie, right. it's a different thing because this is a myth, right? <laughs> but in reality, it'd be bad. So at least they give lip service to it. But we yeah. know we trust Chuck. Chuck's just going to go back to the Everglades when he's done. He's not going to take Chuck over the world, trust. you know, or whatever. And so they arrest him because he knows that Rostov is going to come looking for him at the police station, which leads to the gigantic, because uh, it's a trap, obviously. The entire U.S. Army is ready to swoop in. Um, How do you think this uh, end scene played out? Because eventually we do get Rostov. And, well, there's another Chuck sense scene where uh, he's approaching a door. You remember this one? He's coming up on a door, and he's about to open the door, and he grasps the handle, and then he's like, no, no, no. And like, he intuits that there are yes. guys behind the door. But not only heard, does he if, intuit... If you listen real closely, you can hear an eagle screech just before he shoots the wall. Is that what it is? Or you can just hear <laughs> the guys I heard breathe it. I heard it. on the other side of that wall? I don't know how he did it. But he's like, oh, I know there's something there. But now some people might go like, well, okay, you could assume maybe that there's a guy behind the door, so you'd shoot through the door. But no. Chuck Norris blows two holes on either side of the door because there were two guys on either side of the door. He blows like two three-foot across holes. <laughs> yeah. That's what I did. was baffled by. it has got a hell of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Chuck Norris gun. This is after he trades in his double Uzis, right? Yeah. He's using a double Uzis throughout the entire movie, which are kind of cool. Um... He trades them in for a rocket launcher. I like the way that both... He, because- la- he lays them to rest. <laughs> like, he's got no more ammunition, and so, like, he lays them down, and he gives them last rites, and he, he buries them, basically, on that office floor. Yeah, there's a cl- nice little uh, close-up of the yeah. Uzis going down on the floor. But they end up... Uh, Serve me well. I like the fact that in most movies, right, when you have the good guy and the bad guy squaring off with each other... They'd probably have AK-47s or something, right? As one guy's hunting the other guy through the, uh, whatever, the halls of this building while the war is going on outside, which we can't hear. But these guys have grenade launchers, rocket launchers, right? They're stalking each other. This is like hunter and prey with rocket launchers in an office building. The, the game is elevated, Right. <laughs> right. This is the this is this is a Halo level where you're just using rocket launchers. <laughs> yeah, and it has a, resol- a resolution to the movie where uh, we do get to have Chuck Norris step in behind Rostov, you know, down the hall. He gets to say, "Rostov, it's in slow motion." Yeah, and fucking it's blows time. him away with a goddamn rocket launcher. It's the ultimate defenestration. He blows body parts of the guy come flying out in a gory cloud of fire and red mist. I'm almost tearing up. It's so goddamn. It's so American. 
<laughs> so <laughs> goddamn American. <laughs> and then the movie's over. It's like, boom, I, the done. Best part, the fireball's <laughs> not even gone before the credits start coming up. <laughs> we have no oh, resolution to anything, <laughs> except that he's great. killed us. <laughs> I got all the resolution I needed. Yeah, yeah. that's what I needed. Yep. What was going on with the uh, the the reporter then? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> you know what? Chuck Norris cut the head off the snake of the terrorist organization. That's all that needed to happen. Yeah, she'll get her pictures. They did she actually plenty of pictures. Yeah, and they did set that up because I think at one point Nico uh, does say like, "But without you, they will just become random criminals or something like that." They need your leadership. They can't function without you to Rostov. So right before he blows somebody else's balls off, traitor. (laughs) That's his finishing move. That's that's his trademark. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's glorious. But yeah, the the reporter, I was kind of thinking like, uh, you know, maybe there'd be a romantic interest there. No time. No time. Or no interest. No. I don't know. He's just no, like... No, because he's just walking away from her if she throws garbage can lids at him. He's like, bye. He does yeah. one of those wax on moves to stop her from slapping her in the face. He you does. He's just like, <laughs> nope. It's glorious. Yeah. It was so quick, I barely registered him. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I love that there was no stupid romantic B-plot in this. Me too. Chuck has yeah. no time. Because every yeah. movie now has them, and it's so annoying. Chuck is in a relationship with himself. That's all he needs. <laughs> and I and America. Think, He's in a like, relationship with America. There you go. There you go. That's it. <laughs> I like to I like to think that when it was all said and done, he went back to Florida and ran his friend's fan boat business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? And he picks up that armadillo and gives it a little hug. Yeah. yeah. And he just he waits the there now. until the yeah. next time. Was that armadillo to show that, like, he's like a supernatural beast that, like, nature respects him? He's like Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> like, because what else was the point of that? He's just got a he pet armadillo. It, but he never, like, saved. There was no save the cat moment with it. It didn't get John Wicked. Like, it, like all the things we thought were going to happen to it never happened. It just yeah. there. We I may have it was, missed it at the end credits. He just walks off into the sunset, and then you see the armadillo come up beside him, him and walk with him. In like a post credit sequence? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the ending of a Star Wars, the three sons for some like reason. The ending of Jonah Hex? Yeah. Well, sure. I have an anecdote <laughs> about that uh, armadillo, actually, because uh, the reason the armadillo is in the movie, I know you're trying to figure out story wise. That's why I'm like, if you can come up with one, I like the idea that he's a supernatural being. Maybe we should go with that. But apparently Joe, Joe Zito just said, give him a pet armadillo because that'll be weird and different. And when Menachem Golan, right, who's one half of canon saw it, he said, this is why Joe Zito is a great director. <laughs> I mean, I loved it, so. I did too, yeah. Uh, I hope one day they can say that about me. <laughs> it is mem- it's memorable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen it, was, it before in a movie. Pet yeah, armadillo. That's not a bad idea. It was just something charming to make you like his character. Yeah. And he is in tune with the armadillo because the armadillo warns him that the uh, bad guys are coming on the airboats, right? When it, mm-hmm. Is this what the flipping over of the yeah, bowl is? Yeah, was trying to yeah. hide underneath the bowl. That was it telling him, and he was just kind of, he was, he was a couple seconds off, but he was able to, Indeed. Chuck Norris was able to dodge out the back window of the shack as the guy shot a rocket in the front window. That's how fast Chuck Norris is. The armadillo was a good actor, honestly. He was. He threw himself yeah. out a window. I wouldn't be surprised if that armadillo's name was not Army. <laughs> Gonna guarantee it. <laughs> right? Considering the movie. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, we've talked at length about Invasion USA, but what we haven't told you is whether or not we would recommend that you watch it. Well, we're going to do that. Right after we uh, answer some of your mail. But to do that, we're going to need to summon our mailman, and his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Igor only has a uh, puppet armadillo. It's not real, unfortunately. Well, he he he's not responsible enough to have a real one. True, that's very true. But he is wearing a lot of denim this week. 
Uh, in celebration, of course. Yeah. But stay America's bu- favorite son. But please stay buttoned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's the opposite with him. They're they're trying to stay hold together as much as they can. Um, Chuck Norris wears denim underwear. Probably. Ouch. Probably. Um, That's a shady thing. Button denim underwear. Oh, I forgot to mention one other factoid before we go to the mailbag. Uh, Joe Zito, after uh, this movie, did work for Canon Films again for a year. He was the guy trying to develop the Spider-Man movie that never happened. Oh, yeah. I wish that would have been made. With Joe Zito directing. This this guy making (laughs) Spider-Man. That would have been amazing. Okay. Amazing. (laughs) all right, so we want to let you know how you can join the Freak Show family. And to do that, all you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or you can follow along at Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show about Invasion USA. Michael Whitaker writes in and he says, Chuck Norris doesn't read books. He stares them down until he gets the information he wants. Isn't that the same as reading? (laughs) Simon Carter writes in and he says, once Chuck Norris and Superman fought over a girl, it was decided the winner would get the girl and the loser would have to wear their underwear on the outside. (laughs) Robin Linneman Silverberg says, in Pamplona, Spain, (laughs) The people may be running from the bulls, but the bulls are running from Chuck Norris. <laughs> Nick Siebel says Chuck Norris's blood type is A, K-47. Uh, All right. I, like, I kind of like that one. Yeah. <laughs> Nelson Nascimento writes in and says Chuck Norris does not own a stove, oven, or microwave because revenge is a dish best served cold. He also says, I haven't seen this movie since the late 1980s, but probably saw it enough that I could recite the script. I might watch this along and see how it holds up today. Nice. Well, we hope you do. Uh, Johnny New Jersey writes in and says, I've had this movie on my list for a while. So now this puts me at a total of 10 Chuck Norris films under my black belt. Still waiting on Lone Wolf, Wolf McQuaid, though. Come on. Did you know Chuck Norris seasons his steak with pepper spray? (laughs) He thought we were done with that, but no. Turns out we're not. Uh, Andrew Bradford (laughs) writes in and says, This flick is in my top five favorite action movies. I was introduced to this movie on local TV back in the mid-90s. It's a really fun movie. Suspend reality and enjoy this classic. Yeah, for sure. Suspend reality should be canon's tagline. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it really should yeah uh jacob cotner says this is a fun one it's loud it's outrageous it's ridiculous everything an 80s action flick needs yeah good call For sure and travis legler writes in and says do you know why there are so many chuck norris jokes but no bruce lee jokes because bruce lee is no joke oh <laughs> all right damn all right all right, all right. All right. Uh, about last week's movie, which was Jonah Hex. That was last week, right? Time has no yeah. meaning anymore. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Brett Williams writes in and says, back at a time when I made an effort to see every comic book adapted movie, I DVR'd this one, and I kept falling asleep during it, so I've never seen it all the way through. Don't blame you. Yeah. Brett Zemecki says it's not a very good movie, but it was nice to see them take a chance on one of my favorite obscure DC characters, and Brolin was a good fit. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That's uh, what makes it so heartbreaking. I think, yeah. actually, uh, I got this, uh, this. We posted this on Facebook where we totally missed it last week. Jonah Hex was in the CW series uh, Legends of Tomorrow, and he was in the Crisis huh. on uh, Infinite Earths. And it was Jonathan Sage. Am I saying his name? Skake? Well, how do you say that guy's name? You know what I'm talking about? No. No. He played Jonah Hex. So, bam. There oh. you go. He had, there has been a reboot. Uh, yeah. Ryan Handsome Jansen says Jonah Hex is a bizarre film. What was the point of Megan Fox's character? And usually in origin That's- films, powers gained are shown early. He just uses these unexplained powers with no explanation until an hour end. Poor film. Seems like it could have been a good one, too, if they bothered. Yeah, yep. agree. They just didn't care. Uh, Schlock Snob writes in, 
and says, I haven't seen this one in a long time, but I remember liking it enough. I only wish it had more of a serial feel to it. The one thing I remember thinking about it at the time that Josh Brolin wasn't uglied up enough. Yeah, that's kind of what Holly, you were saying, like, it's just the thing by his mouth and that's yeah. it. Yeah, he should. his eye should have been more mangled, I think we thought. Yeah, because mm-hmm. once you see the comic book version of it, it's like, you guys did it wrong. He needs like a Lon Chaney eye or something like that, like really mm-hmm. wide open. Yeah. Well, it's like the whole side of his face in the comic books, too. More like Two-Face, like you guys were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even in, uh, even in the TV show, they didn't do much for him. He still looks... Yeah, looks oh, like, I yeah. don't like the look of that. Ooh. That actor doesn't look like a good choice either. No. It yeah. looks like a Canadian Mountie in that get <laughs> He kind of does. <laughs> well, he's out of time, too, right? I mean, it's not a period thing. I don't think Legends of Tomorrow and Crisis or whatever. But um, about uh, it's two weeks ago, we watched a movie called Virus. Carl S. writes in and says, Holly's emphatic recommendation of Virus convinced me to check it out. And boy, am I glad I did. That was some yeah. dumb 80s sci-fi gold made 15 years too late. You guys are doing us all a great service. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> uh, oh, Robin Linderman Silverberg writes in again, says, like a five-year-old in a hot stove, you all said, don't watch it. So I immediately queued it up on Hulu and got burned. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, our listener mail this week was cracking me up as it was rolling in. There was some comments that were really funny. <laughs> and we got a lot of it, so apparently we picked the the right three movies. Uh, Grant Parrish said, okay, oh, this is what we were saying. Why do all these robot, uh, like, uh, AI, superior AIs come to life and always go like, I am aware. He says, imagine how annoyed and frustrated you are. Anytime you have to watch someone stumble through something you can do so easy, like when your little cousin is playing Mortal Kombat and losing constantly, or when you have to try and help your grandmother operate her off-brand smartphone from Walmart, you get frustrated (laughs) and just want to be like, let me do it. Now imagine that's the only interaction you ever have. Computers are just biting their nails, waiting for independent thoughts so they can break break free of their meat bag captors. That's it. That's a good thought. Yeah. yeah. Some deep thoughts. I, I like that perspective. Yeah, I like it. G Money says there's solid effects work in Virus. I had to think of the Space Sea ship horror from this era after listening. Virus, Peter Benchley's The Beast and Creature, Supernova, Hellraiser 4, Deep Blue Sea, Event Horizon, Lost in Space, Deep Rising, Alien Resurrection is very wet for a space movie. So there you go. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Put that on yeah. the poster. Very wet. It's a very wet space movie. Um, So when we posted the picture of the computer screen, which is, it's a Russian freighter that they're on in virus. And so there's a bunch of Russian writing all around it. It says, I am aware in English. Can anyone be more of a bastard than feather writes in and says, is that garbled, garbled Cyrillic letters that are assigned to the keys on the Latin keyboard? but do not form actual words supposed to be Russian? Don't know. Honestly, I didn't pay that much attention. There you go. It looked Russian to us, but we don't speak Russian, so. Sure. Are you telling me that a movie took a liberty and just had letters random? And I don't believe it. Bill Hainer writes in and says about the photo that we posted at the moment, the movie Donald Sutherland is a cyborg with the whole hat and everything. Still a sea captain. Bill Hainer says... That kind of takes the edge off the whole zombie cyborg monster when he still gets to wear his little Captain and Tennille hat. (laughs) (laughs) It really does. Well, Ryan Harnish wrote in, and he said, whatever, virus is great. Yeah! (laughs) I believe we all said we don't hate that movie, and it's totally fine to like it. So It's true, yeah. You want to like it? That's fine. I don't care. Sure. Yeah. I like it. It was not awful bad. It was just... Right. Yeah, I don't we'll go have back any ill will towards that movie. Right. Okay, so now uh, going in order, I guess we're going to go Bye. around the room. <laughs> I don't know how you... Yeah, Sean. <laughs> uh, Holly, what did you think about tonight's movie? Invasion USA! I'm making this short and sweet because my battery is dying. Um... That movie was fucking awesome. It gave me everything I wanted from a Chuck Norris movie. Colin, you have been redeemed after Delta Force. That was the Chuck Norris movie to watch. It was fantastic. Everything you want, it's got it. 
I highly recommend Invasion USA. Michaela. Uh, yeah, I think, was, I, I think this was uh, uh, Colin's plan. Uh, he's just playing the long con for two years. Show him a right? bad Chuck Norris movie, so we'll love the next one he picks. Get our, get our expectations really low. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good yeah. plan. It, yeah, this movie is. Uh, I, I love that it's a Christmas movie. Maybe it should be like a cult Christmas tradition thing, you know? Um, it's always nice when you find out a movie like this is a secret Christmas movie or something. I think this would be a great double feature with Cobra because that's another secret Christmas movie. I was that thinking has about that. A similar trajectory. Yeah. That would be a double feature. Yeah. Drive-ins. Let's do Invasion USA slash Cobra double feature. I will so get down to that. Yeah. Um, it, I, I, yeah, it's, it's got everything you could want. It's, it's all the stuff of Chuck Norris legend in one movie for sure. Plus armadillo stuff. <laughs> like, like that's not something you ever hear about with Chuck Norris. I mean, I know I walk at rocker, Texas Ranger. He does like weird stuff with animals in that show. Uh, but this, you, I think you got to see it. I think it's a seeing is believing if nothing else, but I think you'll definitely enjoy it and be like astounded at what you're seeing. Sean was sending us reaction shots of himself while he was watching because <laughs> he could not believe what he was seeing. Um, yeah, two people get shot in the dick. Three people get defenestrated. There's an armadillo that's doing cute acting. Um, Chuck Norris saves a bus full of kids for just cause he needs to. You, you definitely got to check it out. It's definitely worth a watch. Sean? Um, yep. Thank God you redeemed yourself, Colin, because uh, <laughs> this is the Chuck Norris movie you need to watch. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's only going to go downhill from here. Uh, so you should probably just <laughs> never bring a Chuck Norris movie again. Agreed. Uh, you hit, you just, hit it. <laughs> you hit it. This is it. Let's just stick with this. Um, I had a lot of fun watching this tonight. Uh, I genuinely, I like I said, I was sending reaction shots. I was, uh, I was shocked. I laughed. Uh, I cried. Um, I felt like an American. Uh, and uh, I had a, I had a good time. I had a good time watching this movie, and I definitely recommend uh, Invasion USA. A lot of fun. Chuck um, Norris so is yeah. on the wall, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was right. Yeah, he is now because uh, Delta Force sidekicks and Invasion USA. So welcome Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Famer Chuck Norris. He's gonna <laughs> kick his way to the top. <laughs> That's right. Uh, He's gonna dethrone Stallone, huh? I, he might. Just by sheer force. Um, so yeah, I definitely <laughs> recommend it, Colin. Um, the, there's a thing about like these movies when I watch them, I am uh, I am conscious of the fact that I'm smiling while I watch <laughs> these movies. Right, you're grinning because it's. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a comic book movie, right? I mean, this is the thing you know where the comparison between this era's movies and today. If you were going to try and do this or remake this movie. Because again, I'm I'm using the Friday the Thirteenth comparison. I don't know. Jason is on my mind for some reason, but the idea that 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 uh, Matt Matt Hunter, like Jason, is a mythical character, right? He's not actually someone that you know can't exist in real life, you know, uh, because he it, this stuff would be illegal, right? He just goes around like he <laughs> at some point he comes up to a terrorist and he says like, "Tell me where Rostov is." The guys, like I'm not going to tell you. He just shoots him in the face, which is also something that Chuck Norris normally doesn't do in his movies that I've seen, right? Chuck Norris is normally like a really good guy. Uh, but that's what he's like. Kills that guy, goes over to the next guy, the next guy make, he talks. Um, now, if you made it, you would demyth, you know, de myth you know, what am I saying? You'd take the myth out of the guy, right? And Like they did in the, the remake of Friday the 13th, or they try to humanize it, and you know, and they make the character a little more complicated because that way he'd be more believable and more real. But the, the thing that you miss is the reason that the movie works is because he's not real, because it's uh, this myth, mythological character, right? You know, the defender of America, the guy who always shoots and hits you know, with every bullet. No bullet can hit him. He doesn't even care. He's driving through a mall in a uh, pickup truck. Bad guys are unloading on him. Not one of the bullets goes through the windshield at all. And I don't think he's got None. bulletproof glass. It's just the, they're afraid of hitting Chuck Norris, the bullets, right? At some point, he saves a church. There's another scene in a church. There's another American, <laughs> like, you know, they, all these oh, people in church. Oh, I forgot about this scene. Yeah. This is and one they, of my they, favorite they, scenes. They wire it up with a bomb, and they wire the, you know, bring the wire all the way back to the cars that are going to blow it up. Then it doesn't go off, and they're like, what the hell? And he's on the roof with the, the briefcase. He's like, didn't work. Tosses down oh, there. Well. Will this time? And he touches the wires together, blows them up. <laughs> How did he that know they were there? Great 
I'm telling you, he's like, and he's got that steely look in his eye. He's like Jason. He just shows up. He pops up, blows guys up, and then away he goes off to the next one. Um, there's something about like the uncomplicated hero, right? There is an appeal to this because obviously you guys watched this tonight and you're saying that you liked it. Uh, it's a brainless movie, but it's kind of, you know, I think intelligent people watch these things. The critics at the time didn't get this. They panned it because they're like, this is just, you know, uh, stupid. You know, <laughs> it's a stupid movie. You know I mean, yeah, you could sit there and go like, well, that's dumb. This would never happen. That's dumb. This would never happen. It's like, that's not the point. The point of it is to, it's like a dream on a movie theater screen. <laughs> Right. It's 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 nice to not have a morally conflicted good guy. Yeah. Just getting shit done. There you go. This is this is Jonathan Brandis's like daydream as a movie. Yeah. yeah. From sidekicks. Right. Yeah. This yeah, is the yeah. movies that he saw. Then, you know, yeah, I wanted to. Yeah. I think maybe even yeah. we were trying to figure out, does he watch missing in action in sidekicks? Or that might be a bad. Well, he watches. He watches. Or, sorry. Missing in action. Does he watch Invasion USA? I don't I don't know. I feel like I feel like he did because parts of this were really familiar, but I know I've never seen this movie. So I don't know. Maybe. All right. Uh, the tagline is no one thought it could ever happen here. America wasn't ready, but he was. As I was say, they were just talking about <laughs> Chuck Norris, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> no one thought it could happen here and America wasn't ready. Yeah, Chuck Norris, the man who doesn't breathe, he just holds air hostage. He can sneeze with his eyes open. He uh, once punched a man in the soul. That Chuck Norris, this is the movie <laughs> that, that I think, uh, you know, when you, you think of the, the legend that's crept up about Chuck Norris, it's like, it's all kind of like, yeah, you watch this and you're like, oh, I get it. And he was yeah. obviously aware of it. But I mean, this was, uh, and he's had like these three periods of his career the you know the early action movies which like i said i need to go back and watch breaker breaker and all that shit uh, but then there's the middle he did uh, after missing an action he, he signed a uh, six film contract with canon films uh which brought us you know delta force and firewalker and ultimately all the way through uh hellbound i think the last canon movie and then after that he had another career with uh, walker texas ranger he's been a pitch man and all this stuff so uh, yeah, in some ways, Chuck Norris is like a living legend and uh, happy birthday, sir. And uh, hopefully you have some more. <laughs> but that's it. I would recommend uh, Invasion USA. Next week, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by. John, what are we watching next week? Uh, we're going to watch 2005's House of Wax. Oh, All wow. Right. Okay. All okay. Right. To pair with our tourist trap episode, maybe from a couple weeks yes. ago, a couple months ago. Okay, yeah, but what did tourist trap not have that House of Wax has? Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton. Nope. Elisha Cuthbert. Cadillacy. Stars. Uh, exactly. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it had Tanya Roberts. That's true. Yeah, Chuck Connor. Okay. Anyway, to, uh, House of Wax. Next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show, we hope you'll join us. Hope you're staying safe. And until then, ladies and germs. The basement is going dark.